All right, let's get started with this game's history lecture, uh, The Crash of 1983, uh, and let's get into it here. So, okay. The Crash of 83, and I know the font is, hopefully that's big enough for you to read in here. Um, so, 1982, industry was firing on all cylinders, right? Arcades were red hot. Consoles were red hot. You had Atari. You had uh, ColecoVision. You had the Intellivision. You had, uh, you know, so you had a vibrant console scene, a vibrant arcade scene. Remember, the arcades were, like, you know, making more money than Hollywood. It was just like, wow, dominant, right? Then something happened. Now, what I want to make sure that you all understand here is that this happened in America mainly, okay? And it's easy to get kind of an American-centric view of the world. So this is kind of where it happened. This did not happen elsewhere, but it's still super important because, you know, it is the biggest economy in the world, right? And so if video games tanked there, it might, you know, have a negative effect, you know, on the industry. And I also want you to think about this. Okay, history, when you look back on it, always seems linear, right? It always seems inevitable, right? Like, of course, video games are going to be with us. Of course, there is going to be someone that would step in and fill this void that we're about to talk about. But that's not necessarily true. That only feels like that because we're looking back on it, right? Um, there may be a future where, at least in America, video games became not a big deal like forever, and, and maybe we look at it here as like I'm doing something completely different with my life, and uh, video games are something that people elsewhere do, and we entertain ourselves some other way, you know, uh, who knows? Think about that, because the industry really did shrink massively as a result of this crash. Okay, so what led to that? Uh, so part of it was um, the arcade industry was beginning to uh, decline a little bit, that's a factor. Uh, you started to get, you know, too many clones of, you know, too many Pac-Man clones, too many Space Invaders clones, too many derivative games. Uh, also, you had an infamous uh, bad port of Pac-Man on the VCS. Uh, that would be, again, the Atari VCS video computer system, a.k.a. Atari 2600. Um, they expected to sell 12 million copies of this. Now, 12 million games... 12 million units, that would be a massive hit now, like even with the install bases that we have now. Like generally for AAA game development, a hit is somewhere between 5 to 8 million, I guess, these days, um, like a big hit. Uh, so 12 million would be like, you know, that's like a Call of Duty level hit or something like that. Um, they sold 7 million. So they expected to sell 12 they sold 7 million, not, you know, not just 7, 7 million. Uh, and so that was because the port wasn't very good. Had uh, bad flickering graphics. The You know, the, the Atari 2600, a.k.a. VCS, just could not handle Pac-Man. Or at least the programming wasn't sufficient to, you know, make it run okay. Uh, and so, you know, they budgeted for 12, only sold 7. That's a big problem. That's a big shortfall. And then they had the infamous release of E.T., the extraterrestrial, okay, legendary flop uh they knew it was going to be a massive big movie and it was right so they are totally right to think that they just didn't make a very good game right and so yep that's another legendary flop now even more importantly okay then maybe these these games that didn't do as well they probably could have survived that had they properly iterated on their technology okay so um they released the atari 5200 uh, which uh, was not a big success. Part of it, we don't go super deep into it in this lecture, but part of it was uh, the technology wasn't developed enough. It wasn't a big enough advance over the competitors, ColecoVision and Television. Um, and of course, uh, what was happening is the T Atari 2600 was really starting to show its age at this point, right? So you had an aging console, games flopping, and a new console that didn't really connect uh, with the audience. Now, one, another thing to keep in mind, by the way, before we're too hard on Atari, because we're really beaten up on them, right? Like they're just doing, making all the wrong decisions, right? Uh, remember that Atari didn't have the, the game plan, the template. Like, you know, this was new territory. Like, when do you make a new console? Remember that uh, now we sort of know five to seven years, right? That's usually what you want your console life cycle to be. Uh, we know that the general public is very comfortable spending another big chunk of money to buy another new piece of tech at about that time frame, right? We didn't know these things. 
back then. This was all uncharted territory, so they didn't necessarily have a, a solid historical game plan to base their decisions off of. Okay, so uh, Atari's failures of Pac-Man and E.T. caused a chain reaction. So uh, what they ended up doing is they had to offset their uh, losses. And what they did is they decided, okay, what's the best way to sell a lot of games? We'll think about Space Invaders, which was the port that put the Atari VCS on the map. They thought, well, great, we'll just do that. Well, the problem is that's really expensive. You have to pay for those licenses. So they went and just spent lots of money to license these sort of surefire arcade hits, but that was, you know, incredibly expensive. All right, so um, there was a massive glut of software, and this is probably the most popularly known, like the most well-known fact of the crash, is you did have a lot of garbage software being released on the Atari. So uh, the, the, one of the famous examples here, Chase the Chuck Wagon, uh, Korean a dog food company made this, uh, and like, but it, but they're not even the worst, I think, offenders. Um, I actually have no idea if this if the, if the gameplay is any good. You can probably find a ROM uh, out there or like at least a YouTube video pretty easily. Atari did like a Rubik's Cube game, right? Like like why, right? This is this is exactly the Chris Crawford don't copy existing games. I actually, when you think about the Chris Crawford game design stuff, it, the Atari Ru Rubik's Cube game violates like every component of what he talks about, right? It's imitating an already existing game from the real world, which he hates doing. It's a puzzle, which he doesn't even consider an actual game because it has limited interactivity, right? Uh, and of course, the you know the if Atari had a vice president of common sense, that person might have said, what makes this better than an actual Rubik's Cube, right? Like, not much, really, right? So that's just an example of the kinds of things being released for the Atari back then. Uh, yeah. Um, it's see the mobile market. The question for the statewide is it worse or better than than mobile now? I think. Well, I think there's a lot of different differences in that market. I mean, first of all, like, yeah, like there's a lot of garbage on mobile, but it's also like not expensive typically, right? So that's – remember, these games are being released and being sold at like the equivalent of our $60 boxed retail prices you know, today. So that – I think that skews things heavily. Um, you know, uh, So that's one big difference. Uh, also, I think that um, you know, games – are just more established now, period. There's so, there's kind of more of a buffer now, right, for a, a bigger margin of error in terms of, like, how many mistakes an uh, individual company can make uh, and, and cause the entire market to collapse. Because remember, uh, even though Atari had these competitors, it was basically them in, in, in the home console space. I mean, they were the dominant player. So if they went, a lot goes with it. Whereas now you have, I mean, you know, between Steam and... And, you know, PC gaming in general, and you have like, you know, three major console manufacturers, uh, you know, at this point, and you have, you know, the mobile gaming and, and everything and, you know, just more people playing games, period. I would like to think I could be wrong, but I would like to think that there's just a bit more, uh, you know, there's more diversity in the market, you know, which is going to prevent, I think, something like this. Um, so another factor that I want to talk about is uh, the home computer market. Right. In America, especially, I think uh, this was beginning to flourish. And now why would that hurt uh, the video game market uh, when, you know, people could play games on these things? Well, uh, it was hurting them because of a price war that was happening. OK, so what was happening in the uh, early to mid 80s is uh, you had these various different companies uh, and actually Atari was one of them making computers. But another would be, you know, Texas Instruments would be another one. Uh, Commodore is another one. Uh, they were all racing to make the cheapest possible computers. It was a price war. They didn't care if they lost money. They were, you know, their their feeling was we, we we get our device in your home, then we got you right. It's it's that sort of business model where, where we're willing to sell you the razor as cheap as possible because then you buy razor blades from us. That sort of thing, uh, and so. It was starting to happen where home computers were at or below the price of the consoles themselves. And if you're a consumer and there were ads or ads on TV like William Shatner and stuff that that were even like highlighting this, that were basically saying, hey, why in the world would you buy this 
video game box when you can buy a wonderful computer that can educate your kids and do spreadsheets and do all these things. And oh yeah, also play games, right? So uh, that was hurting the market as, as well. So how bad was the crash? Well, pretty bad, okay? Uh, so you have 3.2 billion to 100 million, okay? Like that's an enormous change. I mean, that's just an entire industry vanishing, you know, like, like almost overnight. So what are the effects of this? Uh, lots of people, companies going out of business, okay? You have uh, Magnavox, who made the very first uh, game console. Goodbye. They're gone. They're not, in, you know, they're not doing this anymore, okay? Um, and you had companies like Activision. Now, Activision, who you all know as Activision Blizzard today, uh, just uh, to kind of fill you in a little bit, Activision was actually started because uh, we think of them as this, you know, huge corporate monolith. Oh, big, scary uh, they started out as these programmers working for Atari that thought they can do better outside of Atari. That's how Activision started, okay? Um, and so they uh, had to switch. They survived, but they switched from console to PC game development, which affected games history in a very interesting way, the fact they switched to that. And Atari themselves obviously permanently damaged uh, at this point. They had to be sold again to Commodore International, make makers of the Commodore PCs. Um, and Commodore's perspective was that, uh, okay, you're, you're making computers now, right? Like, uh, and the arcade division, by the way, was kept by Warner. So the arcade division of Atari, uh, did not go with the Atari home division when this sale happened. And so you had this weird division where you had, uh, Atari, the home console company now making PCs, uh, but then you had the, uh, the Atari arcade manufacturing company, these are now separate businesses um, at this point. Okay, so as I like to mention, uh, you know, because oftentimes when you read about the crash of 83 on the internet, this part isn't emphasized, so I like to emphasize it here. Um, the crash was an American phenomenon with consoles, right? Uh, in Europe and elsewhere, uh, the game consoles continued to sell. Right. So, you know, if, if you are in another country, if you're in the Japanese video game development scene, then you're you're, you know, not necessarily noticing this, although they did have a term for this. They called it Atari shock uh, in Japan, I think, is what they referred to this crash as because uh, they recognized it as kind of an Atari driven phenomenon. Uh, so, yeah, they were gaining popularity. Right. So just as the crash was hitting, uh, Japan saw the launch of numerous systems. So you have the Sega SG-1000. Okay, which is uh, the precursor to the Sega Master System. We did not get the SG-1000 here. Okay, we did get the Master System. And then you had another popular console was uh, the MSX uh, computer, which was sort of a hybrid game console computer. Uh, and um, what I like about that system is, of course, it was the, de the actual debut system of Metal Gear. Of course, kind of a big deal for me because I love Metal Gear. Um, and, of course, you have this thing. OK, and it gets its own slide. 100 percent deserves its own slide. Yes, this would be uh, the Famicom, a.k.a. Family Computer. Yes, this is what would become known uh, to us here in America as the Nintendo Entertainment System. Uh, but this was out for several years in Japan before it ever made it here. Right. So this was already in 1983, a thing that was released. And um, I just love that design, by the way. I think the design we got really is super lame. I've always preferred that, especially the way the controllers slot into the side. The color scheme, love it. Love the, love the Famicom. Okay, so uh, one of the consequences of this that's super important uh, with the crash is it clears the way for Nintendo, right? Like, you really had to have this crash happen, I think, for Nintendo to have the opportunity to basically define our industry like it did. Uh, otherwise, you know, Atari would be going strong and it would be doing its thing and releasing other consoles and would be talking about, you know, hey, did you have to like get in a line at Best Buy to get the Atari 18,000 or whatever they'd be calling it now? But that didn't happen because of the crash, right? Uh, so here's what here's kind of what happened uh, with, with Nintendo. So initially, this is kind of amazing to me, Atari had an incredible opportunity to, to make an amazing comeback. Nintendo initially didn't feel like they had the ability to distribute 
the Famicom in America very well, so they wanted Atari to do it for them. Okay, so uh, they initially approached, uh, and, and you've read this in the book, uh, they almost made it happen. So imagine that. The Nintendo is an Atari product, right? Um, almost happened, but it failed because Coleco, all right, managed to use Donkey Kong for their Atom computer. Now, Donkey Kong at the time was Nintendo's hottest property. One thing to remember, okay, when we think of Nintendo, just like I mentioned Activision, we're like, oh, Activision, right? Nintendo's same kind of thing. We think Nintendo as Nintendo, okay? But in 1983, it was just Nintendo, right? It was just, just a company, okay? Like not a global phenomenon, just a company, all right? It just happened to be a company that at this point had one global massive hit, Donkey Kong, okay? But, you know, Mario Brothers had come out. It was considered, but no one knew it would become Super Mario Brothers later, okay? Uh, so really... Atari looked at this as, wait a minute, you made a deal with us that Donkey Kong would be exclusive to computers we we're making, but you're letting Coleco use Donkey Kong on their computer and you lied to us. Now, whether or not that's actually true is, you know, depends on your legal perspective because uh, Coleco's position was that this is a console. It's not a cartridge. Therefore, we, we have the rights for that because they had the console rights. So that really got... Uh, you know, uh, Atari mad, okay? And that was one of the main reasons why this was scuttled and it did not happen. All right, so Atari uh, almost gets a chance to totally revive itself. Now, maybe they would have screwed it up, right? That's one of the things about history not being inevitable. Maybe they botch the Nintendo launch and we don't have Nintendo systems at all in America, right? That's always something to consider. So this doesn't happen. Uh, but what does happen is we have this... Um, First CEO of Nintendo of America, uh, which is Minoru Arakawa. Okay, so he's the son-in-law of the uh, Japanese of the uh, CEO of Nintendo of Japan at the time, Hiroshi Yamauchi. So basically, Arakawa is dispatched to America to make this happen, like make the Famicom happen, make it a thing, as we say, right? Make it a thing in America. Uh, so one of the things he did is, okay, I don't think Famicom's a good name for this market, so let's try the AVS, Advanced Video System. Everyone remember that name? No, you don't, because it didn't actually get called that eventually, but that's what they were going to try to call it anyway. Um, and what they tried to do is they tried really hard to pretend it wasn't a game console. And I think this is a really fascinating aspect of the American market due to the crash. Because of the crash of 83... Game consoles were poison, all right? Like, think about this now. Like, think about my, uh, like, what I had to do to get a PS5, for instance, where I'm like, you know, I got, like, you know, 50 web browsers open. I'm, you know, on a Twitch channel that, like, rings alarm bell. Think about what you, you know, you have to do this to get a console now. They're this popular. And back then, because of the crash of 83, they were considered so poisonous and bad that if you had a game console that you thought was good, you'd have to hide that it was a game console, basically. You have to pretend it was something else. And that's what they did. They're like, okay, we're going to give it a music keyboard and a, and a, uh, and a, like a regular keyboard, and you know, we're going to make it look like a computer. And so you know, this is before it got released, right? This is them going to trade shows, trying to get distribution for it, and no one cared, right? They, they thought they were insane. This, this will never work in this market. Game consoles are dead. We see what you're doing there. The, the ruse is not working. We know it's a game console, right? And so they were struggling. It was hard. They were on the struggle bus, basically, uh, with this. So, yeah, like, like I said, no one wanted to admit it was a console. One of the things they did that did make it to market is the first versions of the, of the Famicom that was called, of course, the Nintendo Entertainment System, uh, was this little robot here, Rob, uh, Rob the Robot. Uh, a great example of 1980s tech, I think, uh, you know, is Rob the Robot, right? If, uh, like the, in, in the 1980s, uh, and this is, by the way, we're now finally getting to things I remember in my life, okay? We're now finally at that point where I can actually think of my own memories. And in the mid-80s, if you're a kid, five, six years old, like I, you know, like I was, uh, robots were sort of all the rage back then. Uh, they were showing up in movies, and so, it, you know, uh, there was sort of this toy obsession of robots. They were trying to kind of hook onto that um, uh, sort of fad. All right. Uh, and also they added the gun peripheral, the initial light gun. Uh, and by the way, the robot was developed 
by Gunpei Yokoi, that guy, the love tester guy, okay? So that was one of his things. Uh, Gunpei Yokoi was the inventor of Rob the Robot. Uh, he developed that. So the robot kind of worked, okay? Maybe the initial attempt, you know, with the keyboard and the music keyboard and all that didn't work, but the robot toy did attract some interest because uh, of the robot fad. So this was actually somewhat successful uh, to, uh, to sort of get people in America to care about it. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is, <laughs> I, I forgot what, what that slide was going to be. And now I realize why, uh, why I have that there. Uh, so by the way, what happened was, okay, they got some attention, but then they started focus grouping the system, right? They started taking the early Nintendo of the early games they had and started having kids play them and they, they got terrible reviews. The, the kids said it was crap. Actually, they didn't say crap. They said, I think, the more aggro term, maybe. Uh, so, yeah, uh, this was not focus testing well. Um, and, you know, you have to imagine Nintendo's frustration at this, right? So, okay, we've convinced some, when I say distributors, I mean, you know, Sears, JCPenney, th these, these big department stores that are almost dead now. In those days, that's how you got stuff sold, is you had to get Sears and JCPenney on, on board, places like that. All right, so imagine Nintendo's frustration. You do the robot thing, and you have a system that's a smash hit in your country. I mean, it's five million consoles have been sold by that point in Japan, and you're like, what can we do to convince you that this is good? Even like the kids, the American kids are getting to play this, they say it's, it's awful. What in the world, right? Um, and... As uh, a result, Minoru Arakawa wants to give up, okay? He's like, this is not going to work here. They hate this, okay? This is like poison in their market, okay? But, and this is uh, where I have a lot of respect for this, uh, Hiroshi Yamauchi is not the type, uh, the late Hiroshi Yamauchi is not the type of CEO that looks at focus testing data. It's not the type of CEO that looks at sort of, you know, qualitative or quantitative, I should say, metrics, he follows his gut, right? And I know that that, you know, we're at an R1 research institution, okay? We're at freaking Purdue where engineering and science and research and study is so important. But I really admire that sometimes in life, the gut, the instinct is what matters. And his instinct was, this is going to be good. And so he tells Minoru Arakawa, I remember his son-in-law, stay on the battlefield. Get back out there. I, you are not going back to Japan. You are not giving up on this. You are making this happen. Okay? He disagreed. Right? Didn't care about the focus groups. But he did have a good idea. He goes, hey, hey look, let's, let's try a small launch. Let's try a test. Let's try New York City. Okay? If we, we'll just release it in New York City. And if it succeeds there, then then that's a good sign. Right? If, if you can make it New York, you can make it anywhere. Right? I'm, that's like literally the Jay-Z song, I think. If you can make it in New York, you can make it anywhere. So uh, that was sort of his good idea, I think, with this. Okay, so the New York debut of the NES. So it's not called the AVS anymore. It's now the NES, Nintendo Entertainment System. The initial stock barely fit in one warehouse, right? So they didn't make that many. Uh, now, again, I have to remind you because history is not inevitable Okay, uh, so much of what we think of as, ah, Nintendo was not there yet. No Super Mario Brothers yet. That did not, that game wasn't out for the uh, New York launch, okay? There was no Super Mario Brothers, okay? These right here were the big system sellers. Those were what they were counting on. Wild Gunman and Hogan's Alley. Anyone play those? Anyone wear a t-shirt with, with that on it? I don't think, you know, if someone, you know, I'm seeing if anyone wants to lie to me about that. Yeah, no, no one remembers Wild Gunman and Hogan's Alley. I actually got those games uh, when, when we got the Nintendo at Christmas. But that was more because, you know, and this is why they launched with these games, by the way. It's not because I cared about them. I didn't give a crap about them. It's because my dad liked them, okay? And it's dad that buys the game console, Okay, so that was kind of one of the importance of, of having these these gun games or whatever. But again, I, I have to stress, all the things we think of of Nintendo weren't quite there yet, right? So their success was not inevitable. Okay, he takes one more. Now, this is Minoru Arakawa's idea, and it's really brave because if this backfires, 
uh, Yabaluchi is probably sending him packing. You think he's not going to send him packing? That's his son-in-law. Uh, no, if you if you read about Hiroshi Yamauchi, he was hardcore. He absolutely would have fired his son-in-law. 100% certain of that. Uh, he says, "Okay, look, Christmas '85. Uh, I'm going to offer a money-back guarantee to the uh, stores that are carrying this, and if any, uh, if they don't sell these units, we're going to buy them back." Okay, that's a risk a manufacturer never takes. Okay, that's unheard of. That's insanity to take that type of risk. All right, and obviously Hiroshi Yamauchi was not happy about this. He was super mad, but it worked. Okay, uh, they ended up selling all of their stock in New York City, which is the first sign of the immense cultural phenomenon that the Nintendo would eventually become. The first sign of that is right here, their success in New York City. And by the way, this mediocre baseball game is another one of their launch titles, by the way. It's just hilarious how uh, they launch, not with the games we think of, but with some of these games that are like really barely better than Atari 2600 games at this point. Okay, so yeah, what games launched in 85? I mean, look at these massive, iconic hits, right? Like Tennis. Wrecking Crew's pretty cool. That That's a good game. I like Wrecking Crew. Uh, what's that? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it, Wrecking Crew is in Smash Bros. Yeah, like... Uh, wait. No. Yeah, Nintendo loves their history. They do a really good job of kind of immortalizing their, their history. Um, so uh, I think actually... This is a list of all the um, of the launch title of the launch games in '85. So let's just take a look. Ten Yard Fight, uh, Baseball, Kukulan's all right. Uh, let's see what else here. Donkey Kong Junior Math. Now there's an exciting. Time. I had that one, and I had it probably because my parents thought it was like you know it would alleviate their guilt of rotting my brain, right? Um, Duck Hunt, that, that's a cool game. Okay, Duck Hunt's a cool game. Uh, I, I will stand for Duck Hunt. Excite Bike is also a cool game, so that's definitely one of the better ones. Uh, that had a track editor. That's a wild thing to have in a game that, that old. So you can actually make your own tracks. Um, golf. Golf is actually okay if you like video game golf. It's not going to win any awards. Um, uh, Gyromite is the Rob the Robot game. Okay, so uh, you, you move the little character around and then the robot in real life. You, you can look at a YouTube of it. Um, it's Rob the Robot's one of those things that looks awesome, but when you actually try to use it, it's like, you know, you'll get like 15 minutes of fun out of it and then into the closet it goes. It served its purpose for Nintendo, though, which again was to make it not seem like a game console, but a toy, rather. All right. No, no, no. I'm good. Totally good. Thank you. Uh, mashable okay what else did we have hogan's alley which okay that one um it's one of the light gun games i actually did kind of enjoy it, even though my dad basically bought it for himself uh it, it does have some fun kind of shooting gallery scenarios um ice climber okay that's that's a pretty good one that's a pretty good one kung fu anyone remember kung fu master from the arcade uh lecture that's what this game is okay uh it's the same it's a port of that game uh, and so that's actually one of the better ones, I think. Uh, and, and that's what gets people confused. They actually, because this has now become far more famous than the arcade game, most people just call it Kung Fu. They don't remember it's actually Kung Fu Master. And they think Nintendo made it. Well, no, that was made by Irem, and Nintendo ported it. So, uh, you know, be, uh, be better than the average person and know those things about Kung Fu. I am not familiar with Mock Rider. Um, not familiar with it at all, actually. Um, and, uh, yeah, they did a pinball, uh, sim that's okay. Uh, stack up is another one I'm not familiar with. And, uh, this is not true. Um, this did not, uh, debut in New York city. So they're, they're just totally wrong here. Um, so anyway, yeah. Okay. Oh, it's an honor system. Okay, gotcha. It's 
kind of going back to uh, Magnavox land there a little bit. Uh, okay, so we got like five minutes left, so let's hit some other things uh, about this era. So uh, one thing Nintendo did is really smart is they partnered with a toy company, World uh, World of Wonder. It might be Worlds of Wonder. That might be a slight typo. Um, and they helped them get into the toy store because, again, they're trying to market themselves as a toy. Um, now, Sega at this time enters the market as well with the Sega Master System. And what's interesting about the Master System, there's two interesting things about it. It didn't do much in America. But it was actually much more powerful than the Nintendo. It had, you know, much better graphics. Uh, and so, you know, they actually had a more powerful system. But what I don't have this in the uh, slides, but I'll just mention that the Master System became crazy popular in Brazil and still is. You can literally still buy it now as a new console in Brazil, which uh, now it's, you know, it's no longer Sega. It's another company in Brazil that distributed. And then they, you know, they basically took it over once Sega stopped making consoles. But you can, right now, if you're in Brazil, you can buy a Master System. You know, it's kind of cool, actually. Uh, just goes to show, you know, don't be too Amer uh, kind of Amerocentric in your thinking. In other places, uh, these things unfolded a lot differently. So it was a massive hit there. I also think the Master System did quite well in Europe. So it really helped establish uh, Nintendo. Uh, now, one of the things that happened, though, with the American Master System is that uh, it debuted with Hang On, um, and Hang On was a cool game. It was an arcade game, obviously, you know, translating arcade games to the, uh, you know, to uh, the console was a surefire hit, but Nintendo, not for the New York launch, okay, and maybe that Mashable article that I looked at wasn't looking at the New York launch, but this wasn't for the New York launch, but for the nationwide launch, Nintendo would have this, okay? So, yeah, this is kind of a big deal, okay? Please don't get this wrong on a test, <laughs> all right, uh, in terms of uh, this game, okay? So, yes, uh, this game, of course, along with The Legend of Zelda, I have to say, uh, really helped launch the Nintendo as, a, as really a cultural phenomenon. And, and this is where my own memories, I think it's helpful that I lived, you know, I was pretty much the perfect age for this. I was, you know, six, seven years old uh, when the NES came out. Um, and really, the thing about playing Super Mario Brothers, it technically did have an arcade release, but it hardly appeared in any arcades. It's actually kind of rare to find, but, but it was a coin-op, okay? Uh, most of us didn't know this. And the thing about... Super Mario Brothers is it just played differently than arcade games, right? It had this world you can explore. Yes, you explored mainly through jumping, but it was still an explorable world, right? It had the warp pipes that you could skip around in. It was just, it was uh, mind-blowing at the time, right? There's a few things in games history I'm going to refer to as like total game changers, all right? This is definitely one of the big game changers here. Uh, is Super Mario Brothers. So obviously, hang on, okay, that's a cool arcade game. Super Mario Brothers, a complete zeitgeist-defining megaton. Obviously, Nintendo's going to have a huge advantage. And of course, Shigeru Miyamoto, designer of that. Okay, so one more minute here. So let me just say, at this point with the nationwide launch, they were a gigantic, massive, huge hit to the point where for a while... Not now, but for a while, especially in the mid to late 80s, video games was Nintendo, and, and, or, and Nintendo was video games. It was just like saying making a Xerox copy of something. Uh, you know, you referred to video games, you were really talking about Nintendo. That's how powerful their market control. And the one thing they did, and they learned this from Atari, and Hir uh, Hiroshi Yamauchi even says this, they understood that Atari had a lot of crap software, so Nintendo tightly, tightly controlled the third-party publishing with a lot of rules, this would eventually bite them in the rear because it would eventually make them hard to work with. But back then, it was definitely a key to their success. Now, um, their tight, tight control of third parties, and I know we're at 320, but let me just mention this, that tight control where they were really strict with what games could be released, they limited how many games you could release, really did open the door to Sega and would allow them to compete later. Okay, that is it. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, oh, the attendance word. Sorry. Thank you, WebEx. It is chase the chuck wagon or just chuck wagon. OK, uh, that is the attendance word today. Uh, thank you statewide. I even remember to put the assignment up, so it's already there. Oh, so it's the, 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 the
Everyone individually. Yep, that's right. Producing a game design time. Yep. Just all the time. Three. 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 Three.